Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old video we're going to talk about dating contestant Rodney Alcala. And what a story it is we have for you today folks. In 1978 Rodney appeared on ABC television series The Dating Game, a very popular show ladies and gentlemen. Being introduced as a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the darkroom at the age of 13. Fully developed. Between takes you might find him skydiving, or maybe even motorcycling. Let's hear it for Rodney, quite the catch. And he actually won the date with the bachelorette, but unfortunately she refused. She didn't go on the date with him because she said he was weird and she was right. Unfortunately folks, he was up to no good. Yeah, he was up like a lot of really weird stuff. Like real bad. So, let's get into it. Rodney Alcala was born on August 23rd, 1943 in San Antonio, Texas. The dad would move the family down to Mexico in 1951. You know the uh, good old signs, telltale signs of uh, serial killers, the McDonald triad, linking cruelty to animals, obsession with fire setting, and persistent bedwetting past a certain age. They are all linked to violent behaviors, particularly homicidal behavior. Well, those things, they tend to kind of be giveaways. Hey, if you see any kids doing those things, like when they're too old to, uh, I don't know what you're gonna do with them, but you should do something. Yeah, Rodney showed none of those signs at all. He actually seemed like a perfectly normal kid. His dad would abandon the family at like age eight, but that was like the only even slightly dysfunctional thing about Rodney Alcala. Uh, because you think he would show at least one of those signs because he goes on to do a uh, nothing good, nothing for the benefit of humanity. He was popular at school, had many girlfriends. Then, in 1960, at age 17, Rodney joined the United States Army and served as a clerk. In 1964, after what was described as a nervous breakdown, he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder by a military psychiatrist and discharged on medical grounds. And then, much later in life, after being imprisoned uh, for being a serial killer, he would also be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and malignant narcissistic personality disorder with psychopathy and sexual sadism comorbities. Tragically, um, the world would have to find this out the hard way. Rodney enrolled at the UCLA School of Fine Arts, where he earned his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in 1968. That's also the same year where he kidnapped and assaulted and tried to kill his first victim, Tali Shapiro. In 1968, Tali Shapiro was eight years old and walking to school in Hollywood. A man driving a beige car approached and asked if she needed a ride. She told the man that she didn't talk to strangers. He convinced her that he knew her family and that he was safe. Tally got into the stranger's car against her better judgement. That stranger was Rodney Alcala, no shit. Now a neighbour saw this interaction and he ended up following Rodney's car to Rodney's apartment where he saw, you know, them both go in and he was like, that's no good. He called the police. Upon arrival, the LAPD found the child lying face down in a large pool of blood on his kitchen floor. When they saw her, they thought she was dead. Thankfully, she wasn't, and while the police were giving her medical attention, Rodney managed to escape. But now, Rodney's on the run. He fled to New York and enrolled in the NYU Film School. From 1968 to 1971, even though he was listed on the FBI's most wanted list, he lived undetected and in full view using the name John Berger. Apparently the guy who taught Rodney to use a film camera and all that shit was none other than uh, Roman Polanski. Who? Well, let's move on. Then in June 1971, Rodney commits his first murder that we know of just before he was to move to New Hampshire for the summer to work as a summer camp counselor, Rodney offered to help flight attendant Cornelia Crilly move into her Manhattan apartment. That didn't end well for her, 
that Rodney wouldn't be a suspect until almost four decades later, when they matched a bite mark on her body. So, after helping helping her move into her apartment, Rodney then went off to that summer camp, where he was recognized by two girls who saw his wanted poster in the post office. And the police arrived and arrested John Berger, Rodney Alcala. In August 1971, Rodney was back in LA, you know, facing charges for what he did to Tally Shapiro, but prosecutors, they had a pretty big problem. Tally Shapiro and her family had gone to Mexico once she had made a full recovery, and they weren't really interested in coming back. So, without their main witness, a decision was made to offer a plea deal. Rodney Alcala was charged with rape, kidnapping, assault, and attempted murder, and he accepted a deal to plead guilty to child molestation. The other charges were dropped. He was sentenced to one year to life and was paroled after 34 months under the Indeterminate Sentencing Program. The program allowed a parole board, not a judge, to decide on when offenders could be released, based on if they appeared rehabilitated. With Rodney's ability to charm, he was back out on the streets in less than three years. Within eight weeks, he returned to prison for violating his parole for providing marijuana to a 13-year-old girl. She told police that Rodney kidnapped her, but he wasn't charged with that. Rodney spent another two years behind bars and was released in 1977, again under the indeterminate sentencing program. He returned to Los Angeles and got a job as a typesetter for the LA Times. Rodney then uh, managed to get his parole officer to agree to let him visit family in New York in July 1977 where he would murder just straight up another person, Ellen Jane Hover. Eleven months later, her bones were found on the grounds of the Rockefeller estate in Westchester County. A number of eyewitnesses said they'd seen Ellen talking to a man who matched Rodney's description outside her apartment in the days leading up to her disappearance, as well as the day she disappeared. He was also seen at the Rockefeller estate where she would be found. So Rodney was questioned by the police in her disappearance, but, um... They had jack shit to go on. Uh, he refused a polygraph and they didn't have a body, so no body, no crime. I heard that's the law. In the meantime, Rodney was back on his way to LA. However, while he was traveling to LA, he would do something else. Now, a quick uh, jump to the future. In 1980, photos were found in Rodney's uh, a locker he had in Seattle. A lot of photos were found in there. In 2010, the NYPD and Huntington Beach PD released 120 of them to the public, in hopes that people may come forward and identify the women or children in them. In 2013, Kathy Thornton came across Alcala's photo archive. Kathy's sister Christine had gone missing in the spring of 1977. Looking through the photos, she spotted one of a woman on a motorbike. Upon closer inspection, she had no doubt that the woman was Christine, who was six months pregnant when she disappeared. Christine's remains were found in Wyoming in 1982. Investigators figured that Alcala had met Christine and she agreed to go for a ride with him and pose for pictures. The photo appears to have been taken not far from where her remains were discovered. Now, let's go back. Once in LA in 1977, Rodney Alcala went on a murderous rampage, having just come from Wyoming. In November 1977, he murdered 18-year-old Jill Barcombe, a New York native who had recently moved to California. Now, originally police believed her to be a victim of the Hillside Strangler. An 18-year-old Jill Barcombe. This is the first major break in the case of 13 young women who've been strangled and dumped on Los Angeles area hillsides. But that's, a, that's another story. In December 1977, Alcala murdered 27-year-old nurse Georgia Wixted. This is Channel 5, KTLA, Los Angeles. From the Chuck Berry stations in Hollywood, California, it's The Dating Game. Thank you, and welcome once again to the Dating Game. It's time to meet our first three eligible bachelors for game number one, 
And here they are! On September 13th, 1978, Rodney was in between the murders. On this day, he made an appearance on The Dating Game as Bachelor number one. Good luck, gentlemen. Well, let's see. Bachelor number one is a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at the age of 13, fully developed. <laughs> Between takes, he might find him skydiving or motorcycling. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Rod, welcome. And we're going to start by having them say hello to you and see how they sound. Number one, would you say hello to Cheryl, please? We're going to have a great time together, Cheryl. What's wrong with uh, morning, afternoon? Well, they're okay, but night times when it really gets good, then you're really ready. I'm a drama teacher, and I'm going to audition each of you for my private class. Bachelor number one. Hey, you're a dirty old man. Take it. Oh, come on, over here. <laughs> I am serving you for dinner. Oh. What are you called and what do you look like? I'm called the banana and I look really good. Uh, can you be a little more descriptive? Peel me. <laughs> The Bachelorette, Cheryl Bradshaw, picked Rodney as the winner. However, after spending time backstage, Cheryl declined the date. Thankfully, you know, to her instincts, uh, she survived. <sighs> Can't say the same about uh, many more victims. So let's talk for a minute about why he did that. Went on the telly and took so many pictures detailing his crimes, for that matter. Rodney loved camera, video, different forms of media. It gave him a real thrill when it came to doing his horrific work. For one thing, it helped him get close to victims without arousing suspicion, just a photographer. And he could also obsess over his victims in an acceptable way. And for another, he got pleasure out of detailing his victims and the aftermaths. Rodney liked to prolong the suffering of his victims. He would strangle them almost to death only to let them go before he'd start strangling them all over again. Then he would leave the bodies in grisly, sexually suggestive positions to greet the authorities. His taking pictures of them was just another way to enjoy their suffering. Rodney going on a TV show is just another example of a serial killer getting the attention they love. A lot of these people want to be found. They want the recognition. They want to be like celebrities. And what could give someone like this more of a trill than appearing on a TV show to a round of applause in the homes of millions of people presenting a facade, which no doubt he got enjoyment out of all the while knowing in his mind he was a depraved killer. He definitely got off on this. Ah, sure, it's, it's fucked, isn't it? Oh, come on, over here. <sighs> In June 1979, Alcala murdered 33-year-old legal secretary Charlotte Lamb. That same month, also Jill Parenteau and Robin Samso. 12-year-old Robin Samso loved to dance and had struck a deal with the ballet studio in town where she would work answering phones for a couple of hours in exchange for lessons. On June 20th, 1979, she had arranged you know, to go to the studio later on that day, but before she did, she was going to the beach to meet her friend, Bridget. So once Robin and Bridget are there on the beach, a man comes up to them with dark hair, asking if he could take their photograph. Robin was like, yeah, sure. But then a neighbor came, he asked, was like, is everything okay? And the guy with the camera fucked off. Later that day, an employee at the ballet studio called Robin's home, telling her family she never showed. And so her mother called 911. Twelve days later, Robin's remains were found in the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains on July 2nd, 1979, around 40 miles north of where she was last seen. Investigators interviewed Bridget, the friend Robin was with when the man asked to take their picture, and from her description, a sketch of the man from the beach was produced and distributed throughout Southern California. The sketch was a good portrayal of Alcala, and when his parole officer in LA saw it, he notified the Huntington Beach PD that they had to take a look at Rodney. 
On July 14, 1979, police finally arrested Rodney Alcala before he vanished again. Police impounded his car and searched his residence. They found a receipt for his storage unit. Law enforcement obtained a warrant to seize the storage locker in Seattle. They used a key discovered in Rodney's car to open the padlock. And inside, they found box upon box upon box of unnerving photos of women and children. There was also a box of used earrings that Rodney kept as trophies. Robin Sanso's mother claimed a pair of gold earrings he had were her own. Robin wore them frequently, and she had been unable to find them since she went missing. On July 28, 1979, Rodney Alcala was arraigned in um, Orange County for the murder of Robin Samso. By the way, he pled innocent to all charges, because of course he did. The Samso hearing started in September, and he was convicted. Rodney was sentenced to die in California's gas chamber in 1980. However, the California Supreme Court overturned the verdict because the prosecution showed jurors evidence regarding Rodney's previous sexual offences. He was tried a second time in 1986, past crimes omitted. The judge again sentenced Rodney to death, a decision the Supreme Court upheld unanimously. In 2001, Rodney's death sentence was overturned a second time, this time by a federal appellate court who thought significant evidence had been held back during the previous two trials. As preparations were underway for a new trial, investigators were busy sequencing Rodney's DNA. So this was going on for like over 20 years of sentencing him and being back in court again and again and again. Rodney's DNA was matched to biological matter at the scene of four murders, Jill Parenteau, Charlotte Lamb, Georgia Wixted, and Jill Barcone. Alcala was still to stand trial a third time for the murder of Robin Samso. The prosecution requested that Alcala's trial for Robin's murder be combined with the murder trials for Jill Barcombe, Georgia Wixted, Charlotte Lamb, and Jill Parenteau, to which Alcala strongly protested. I guess in his mind, you know, one was bad enough, he didn't need another four victims. In 2006, the California Supreme Court granted the request to combine the murder trials. In 2010, 66-year-old Rodney Alcala stood trial for the five murders. As Bundy did in his trial for the Florida sorority sister murders, he opted to represent himself. The trial, it was a circus. Rodney would question himself using different voices. It would go on for like five hours. Really, really weird. Robin Samso's mother had to endure his questioning during the trial. She actually brought a gun with her to the trial and planned on shooting him, but she stopped, later saying, Robin's hand on my arm stopped me. Rodney Alcala insisted that on the day Robin Samso went missing, he was applying for a job at Knott's Berry Farm. You roller coasters, woo! Murphy also questioned Alcala's alibi at the time of Samso's abduction, that he was at Knott's Berry Farm at the time. So there isn't a single witness that puts Rodney Alcala at Knott's after 3 o'clock, except for Rodney Alcala. And that the gold earrings Robin Samso's mother said were Robin's. He's like, no, they're my gold earrings. Come on, I like to look snazzy. There should be some earrings. Some pictures with earrings. During a two-hour, often rambling, closing argument Monday afternoon, accused serial killer Rodney Alcala, who is defending himself in the death penalty trial, sat at the council table and spoke in a dull monotone. Alcala could not make his laptop computer project on the large courtroom screen, and he often scrambled to find photos and other exhibits. Alcala spent some of his argument attacking the credibility of Marianne Connolly, 12-year-old Robin Samso's mother. Alcala is accused of kidnapping and murdering Samso in 1979. Alcala claimed Connolly, who he refers to as Frazier, Connolly's previous name, made up a story about her daughter's earrings being the same earrings that were found in a Seattle storage locker rented in Alcala's name. No testimony from anyone other than Mrs. Frazier that Robin's ears were pierced. Uh, none of her friends were aware of that. Uh, they were unaware of her wearing earrings, and uh, Mrs. Frazier had plenty of opportunity to provide you, the jury, with a picture of Robin wearing earrings. She stated on the stand that she had pictures of Robin, and if Robin, like she says, uh, 
four earrings all the time, that was her habit, then there should be some earrings, some pictures with earrings, and there should be some person who isn't familial uh, to uh, testify that Rob wore earrings. However, no one uh, testified other than Mrs. Frazier that Robin wore earrings. Alcala was more or less 100% focused. Alcala was more or less 100% focused on convincing the jury he was not responsible for Robin Samso's murder, uh, forgetting he was also on trial for four other victims. And when asked about those, he was like, don't remember, I have no idea, don't remember. But I didn't kill Robin, I remember that. On February 25th, 2010, the jury found Alcala guilty of all five counts of capital murder, one count of kidnapping and four counts of rape. During the penalty phase, Alcala attempted to sway the jury away from the death penalty by playing the song Alice's Restaurant by Arlo Guthrie. I wanna kill. I wanna, I wanna kill. That strategy, I don't know why he thought it would work. It's like a, it's like kind of a comedy Thanksgiving song, I think. Uh, so I don't know what was going through his noggin when he played that. He was like, yeah, hey, this will convince them not to kill me. Um, that didn't work. The jury and the judge were like, death penalty. Laura, that fate is death. He's heard it again and again and again, death. In fact, it was one of the quickest uh, deliberations in a death penalty case in Orange County history. It took this jury less than an hour to reach that verdict. Now, Rodney Alcala earlier had told the jury in his closing arguments, again, he acted as his own attorney. He had told the jury, basically, go ahead and give me the death penalty. I dare you, because all it's going to do is lead to another appeal. Then he also told them that if you give me the death, you are just as guilty of murdering me as anyone else. But apparently, the jury did not buy it whatsoever. The prosecution called Rodney Alcala. Alcala, quote, a monster, a monster who loves to kill women. He killed Robin Samso, Jill Peranto, Charlotte Lamb, Georgia Wixit, and Jill Barkham. Killed them, brutalized them, and absolutely tortured them, and the prosecutor let him know that. Rodney Alcala is now in his 70s, frail, and allegedly in the throes of deep dementia at a California holding facility. I'm called the banana. So, honestly, fuck him. Let him rock. Lock him up, throw away the key. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we just came from court today uh, where Rodney Alcala was sentenced uh, to two concurrent 25 years to life prison terms for the murders of two beautiful young women who didn't live past the age of 23. Alcala himself is 69 years old, and this sentence, his pleas and the sentences ensures that he, will that he will serve the remainder of his life in prison. We're joined today, as you can see, by many, many members of the victims' families. Uh, I want to thank them for their courage and their perseverance over the years, and for coming today uh, uh, to be here uh, at this proceeding, and this important proceeding, Clearly, uh, the young girls that were murdered by Rodney Alcala were not forgotten by their families or friends over the past decades. And certainly, they were not forgotten either by this office or by the New York City Police Department. Now, at the outset of this case, some questioned the utility in bringing an investigation and a case against a person already on death row. And they asked, why is this necessary? The simple answer is, you cannot get away with murder. A lot of people believe that there are more victims of his out there somewhere. 120 of the photos found in Rodney's Seattle locker have been released by various police departments in hopes that people may come forward and identify the people in them, that these could be many more victims and many more missing people, and that families get the closure they deserve.
Thank you so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Take care of yourselves. Mike out.